Hello and welcome. How is it possible to get so totally close to wiping out a disease, 99% eradication, and then just fail to tackle that 1%? In the case of polio, the international community has just fallen short and risks the return of the disease in even greater numbers if concerted action isn't taken soon. Enter the financial and political clout of Microsoft founder and global philanthropist Bill Gates and his wife Melinda. Through their influential foundation, they're stepping up the effort to make polio suffer the same fate as smallpox and be totally eradicated from the planet. Attending the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, the powerhouse couple announced a $100 million pledge from their foundation to eradicate polio. Well, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates join me now to talk about that pledge and to talk about the broader work of their foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Gates, if I could start with you, you know, you've made this big announcement at Davos in the effort to eradicate polio, $100 million from the, the foundation to, to try and boost that effort. How is this money going to be used? How are you going to make sure it's, it's applied in an effective way? Well, the polio campaign is about getting out and vaccinating all the kids. Every kid needs to get these drops uh, three times or more to be protected from the disease. And so in the countries where there's still a lot of polio, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, there are places where they're doing this six times a year, asking all the kids under five to come out. So the money goes to pay the vaccinators, to make the plan, to do the promotion, and because you're giving billions of doses, uh, it costs almost a billion a year to run, run these campaigns and finish this disease off. Now, all right, let me, let me put it to you this way, Ms. Gates. Uh, Paint me a scenario, a world without polio, how would it be different? It would be so different because you wouldn't have to worry about this child paralysis that comes. In fact, what they're saying is, you, you know, if you get vaccinated for polio, we have to get it contained in these countries because, of course, it crosses border. The transmission is huge with there's migration. But they're saying if we get polio contained, there will basically be averting 8 million people who otherwise would have gotten polio between now and 2025. 8 million people who won't be paralyzed. That's huge. Of course, it's got to the stage where it's, it's pretty much 99% eradicated. And it sounds strange to, to be just 1% away, but it also means that it is a, a difficult disease to eradicate. So, you know, how, how much of a challenge is it going to be to get that 1% knocked out and then to maintain it? We're absolutely in that end mile. And you're absolutely right that the very end of these pieces of getting something eradicated, the only thing we've ever eradicated from the face of the earth is smallpox in 1979. But once we got it eradicated, we stopped having to spend money on it. And so we've got to do this. Governments are incredibly committed. The government of India has already put up 600 million of their own money. They're running an unbelievable campaign. We refined the tools in the last year, so we're using a more effective tool, more effective vaccine in India and Nigeria, which is how we're getting these cases down. And we're just going to have to keep at it till we get it done. Mr. Gates, why polio, though? Is it, is it because it's so close? You have to be careful which diseases you pick to eradicate. Most diseases, you just want to reduce the cases without uh, driving it to zero. This one, uh, it is possible because uh, it's been eliminated from the rich world. And it's awful that uh, why should it be in the poor world if it's, if it's not in the rich world? Uh, a billion a year in some ways is a lot to run these campaigns. But compared to the misery that it causes, it's not much at all. And so I think it, it will not only be great to be rid of polio, but it will show that even in the toughest areas, Sudan, Ethiopia, all these places that have worked hard on this, you can make breakthroughs in global health. And right, it used, we used to think Nigeria would be the toughest, uh, and it's still pretty tough. Um, now it looks like Pakistan might be the toughest. So, you know, we just have to do a really good job everywhere. I wonder, do you ever face the, the, the challenge of people saying to you, well, look, polio is not my prime concern. It's sustainable food sources. It's, it's other issues that really you should put your money into. Sure, we hear that from people and they say, why is this a priority? But when you go and say, you know, it's a few cents for a polio vaccine and it's a child who won't have paralysis their whole life. If you're paralyzed in the developing world, you're dragging yourself around. I mean, you have no economic means of lifting yourself up and you're dragged to your family. So trying to explain to people how few cents it costs per child and that we'll have the chance to not spend on this in the future, we then can spend on other things. But it's also not an if then trade off either. We do ask people to also invest, which we do as well in food security and agriculture. Those things are also important. And I wonder what, you know, how really high up polio is on that list of priorities for governments and how you push it up further on that list? Well, I think there's a generation, even in the United States, that remembers polio 
Uh, a lot of people have come forward and, and said, okay, uh, an aunt had this, a friend had this. And so they really are people who both are willing to give and are willing to speak out politically and say the government should uh, work on this. There are tight budgets all over the world, so we didn't pick the easiest time to do this. As people are trying to close their deficits, the question about the foreign aid piece and reducing that definitely comes up. Even the parts that are super effective, which food and uh, health aid have these measurable impacts and improve, improve things for everyone. So we're having to speak out to make sure that the distance where you don't actually see the crippled kids mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you don't know that that is still out there in the world. Now, Ms. Gates, I know both of you do travel regularly and, and you go to Africa, you see the, the conditions on the ground. I wonder when you see what happens out there, the, you know, what you, what you, how you regard the challenge of getting vaccinations out to, to areas where there's conflict, where there's difficult uh, access and so on. What do you think will be the challenges or how can you overcome those challenges? Well, that's the great thing about a vaccination program is they work even in times of conflict. We've seen it in Somalia, we've seen it in Sudan, we saw it years ago in El Salvador. I was just in Kenya, actually, to see the rollout of a brand new vaccine, a vaccine for a pneumonia disease that kills, we know that pneumonia kills 1.6 million children children a year. Finally, through this global alliance for vaccines and immunizations, we are now creating vaccines that are specific to Africa. They're African strains. And I wanted to go to Kenya to see, is it possible to roll out a new vaccine? And they're doing it. They're training their healthcare workers. They're getting it into children. And we're going to roll this vaccine out across Africa. And the neat thing is that when we got into vaccine work, it used to be that one, the vaccines that were needed specifically for Africa weren't created. There was a market failure. And two, the vaccines we had in the developed world that would work in Africa took 15 or 20 years to get from the developed world to the developing world. Now that gap has come down to one to two years. So we are making huge progress in vaccines. Now, of course, one of the big challenges is every, every day is a delay. And Pakistan, for example, has seen uh, a, a rise again in polio cases. I know it's a particular area of concern as well. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, Sayyid Yusuf Gilani, has announced that, you know, there is this... Uh, uh, National Emergency Action Plan on Polio Eradication 2011, uh, but he says his government hasn't got the, you know, hasn't got the, the, the resources or the, the ability to tackle it. So how do you expect, for example, Pakistan to benefit? Well, Pakistan uh, receives a lot of donor assistance. Overwhelmingly, its vaccination costs and its polio costs are paid by outside donors. And so there is no uh, fiscal reason that they shouldn't be able to do it. India actually pays for its own polio costs, uh, which is, is fantastic, but Pakistan, the support's forthcoming. And you know, we're gonna make sure that the shortage of money is not what holds this thing back. Now, Pakistan has to find all the kids. Uh, kids are moving around, they have conflict areas, and you know, the government needs to really pay attention to, to do the surveys. And I, I think they're a recent commitment. I met with the president, uh, talked this over with him, and uh, he reaffirmed his commitment. His daughter, uh, quite a while ago, was one of the first people to get polio drops, and so she's one of the, the symbols of this uh, campaign, the daughter of Benazar Bhutto. So, uh, you know, I think they are really gonna step it up. You also met with the Crown Prince uh, in Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, who also is committed to, uh, to helping the Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, effort. And I wonder what, what has come out of that meeting, because in many cases, pledges have been made and they haven't been honored. Well, in this case, uh, the, the Crown Prince is being very generous. Uh, it's over 50 million uh, that he's put forward, a third for polio eradication, two thirds for vaccines, targeted to those two countries. And, uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, he's been super prompt, easy to work with, and, and we're looking forward to working more because he understands things in those countries, even some of these tough issues of delivery. I think his advice, his influence will be helpful. We're health experts. He knows about these countries, and so there's a, a lot in common. Ms. Gates, I want to put an email we got to you from a viewer. It came from uh, Doug Kassa, one of our viewers, sent this through Facebook, who says, it's great the efforts that the wealthy uh, are making to give back to the world has, that has given them so much. However, the role of charities and foundations should not be to replace the role of governments but to supplement their efforts the reduction of funding by governments is thus a worrying sign and I wonder has it come down to depending on 
people like yourselves and uh, private organizations that can actually uh, make this effort and, and fill in the gap where governments are failing? I th his question is exactly the right one, which is no, private organizations can't begin to fill in where these governments, if they stop, if the donor nations stop giving money. There's no possible way. All a, ph a philanthropy can do is really be that catalytic wedge, really show the way. So do some innovations, bring the prices of vaccines down, get new vaccines, stimulate the drug companies to create new vaccines for the developing world. That's what we can do, but it takes a public-private partnership. Well, we'll come in with some private dollars, but it's large-scale governments giving to the Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, and it's their commitment of money that we can then go and say to the vaccine manufacturers, they're committing to a certain number of donors doses per year so it makes sense for you to make this vaccine. So there is no way we can fill in those gaps and we need donor nations to do what Prime Minister Cameron did today and to step up and say we still believe this about this even in tough economic times for our own countries. Is, is his commitment rare though? You find him because he said irrespective of the austerity measures Britain's going through I'm still going to commit to that that uh, effort. He's shown a lot of leadership. We hope others will do the same. But there was a commitment by a lot of European exactly. countries to get their aid up to 0.7% of their overall economy of GDP. And the UK is on a track to meet that promise. Others are, are not tracking up to that level. Uh, but I think the fact that he is will, will help, it'll encourage people, um, you know, the, the money will be well spent. He said $60 million, he's doubling Britain's pledge, but he also said he wants, uh, you know, fivefold uh, input from other nations to show there is dedication. Is that going to work? Is that the right kind of pressure? Well, it's fine because we need to raise that money just to fund these campaigns. We've got a budget. It's very well laid out. Somebody can see exactly how uh, the budget's constructed, how the money is spent, and I, so his putting in it in the form of a challenge is absolutely fine. Um, I'm one of the people who work hard making sure other governments uh, know about that and, and that we fulfill his uh, match uh, condition. Do you believe this, the path to success and execution of this uh, and accomplishment of this uh, goal is, is predictable? No, there's risk involved. Uh, we need generosity, we need some improvement in the vaccine, uh, we need great execution on the, on the ground, and we need a little bit of luck as well. Ms. Gates, I'm going to ask you another email question, if I may. This came from Germany, from Eldira Xafa, who says, if workers were paid fairly and corporations stopped environmental exploitation, we wouldn't need their charity. Donor programs undermine the possibility of building sustainable health systems that are responsible to citizens. Accepting charity, which comes out of injustice, is not the solution but the root of the problem. How do you regard that? Well, that's not what I hear when I go to African nations. I mean, you know, again, I just came from Kenya. I just came from Ghana. And they're saying that, you know, donor money is fundamental. They can only put in so much money for their own sustainable development. And they're working hard to also make uh, commitments to increase their percentage of their health budget from GDP. But their GDPs aren't, aren't large enough. So in the case of vaccines in Kenya, they're putting in $6 million. That's what they can afford this year. But we're making sure that, you know, $60 million goes into Kenya to roll out these new vaccines if we're going to save those children. So it takes the nations coming together and having a joint plan. The donor nation's plan has to meet what that nation is trying to do itself for its own children or feeding its population. But it's the two together that make progress forward. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Gates, is there any danger that efforts and, and such ad advocacy by people like yourselves could actually encourage governments to say, well, look, they can take this on. We can quietly default on our responsibilities. Well, the, the tr the data is in that the rich world governments have increased their spending on these health issues dramatically. Uh, as uh, a number of new actors have come in and we've proven the value for money, and there's been a big increase. And so the reduction in childhood death uh, has been fantastic and we have very aggressive goals. Almost nine million uh, died last year before the age of five and we're saying it, if things are done right, uh, we can cut that in half. And, you know, that really, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, so, no, government aid is on the rise for these important areas. Now, of course, you have a, a loud voice, metaphorically speaking. Um, awareness is a key issue. Um, to what degree can awareness be increased? I know, for example, you know, we've done a documentary at this channel on polio, but how do you feel it could be increased? Well, polio needs to, uh, we need to update people on how close we are and yet uh, that we need uh, their, their support on this thing. 
The people who know what aid really does are supportive of aid. The ideal is to go to Africa and actually see it for yourself. That's what re-energizes both Melinda and I, is to see the mother with a bed net. And you know, we don't say, oh, this is some awful thing, this mother had her child saved. We say, this is great. Now she's on a path to support herself. And you know, countries do graduate from aid if uh, the right things are done for them. Uh, is media awareness part of the plan? Absolutely. You have to have media awareness. And I think one of the nice things is that the social media gives us another opportunity to connect. Because what we find is that when people really connect with that person in the developing world and they see that story, that, that real life changes, they can relate to them and say, well, that would be like as if my neighbor had that problem going on. I would step out and help them. So social media is another way to move the dial and to get citizens to say to their government, it's important that you keep giving to these causes. That is part of it. The citizenry stepping up and say, we care about being a generous nation. We care about our national security. We want you to invest in these things so we don't have further problems also down the road. Sir, an email to you, Fami. This came in from uh, Zambia, from uh, Mutimba Mazui, who says, invest in education and health and do more to reduce corruption and cronyism, which seems to be more deadly than AIDS and malaria combined. A living example is the looting of the Global Fund for AIDS uh, by various NGOs in developed and developing countries. Now, in terms of the, the fate of the Global Fund, well, how do you regard what's been going on with that? Well, Global Fund's done a great job. Uh, they found a few cases where the money was not spent on what it should be, and they cut those people off. And so that is the way it should work. And shame on those people. It was a very, very small percentage of the money. Uh, Global Fund is saving lots of lives. You know, we should all uh, be very thankful for the, the incredible execution there. Uh, but you know, whoever's doing that corruption, it's awful because they tarnish the whole cause and really uh, cause some people to question whether they should be generous or not. And, and so it's, uh, it's an awful thing, uh, but uh, smart approaches can keep it to a very small amount. And that's why I wonder how you can make sure that the accountability is there so, for example, the credibility is not undermined. Exactly. And that's what's so important about these multilateral institutions is they're building the accountability into their organization. So the Global Fund does its own audit by country. In fact, I just had a discussion in Kenya with the Kenyan health ministry where they're saying one of our payments was held up because they weren't sure we had all the right receipts. And they're saying, you know, so we're getting the money in. So the accountability is there. Global Fund did exactly what we want them to do is their own accounting in their own transparency. So what's recently come to light is something they found out and stopped actually months ago. That's precisely what we want to have happen. And that's what should have ha happen. So we all know we can keep investing in these places and get our money's worth. Let me ask you about the giving pledge and how that works, the concept and, and idea behind that. Yeah, so we've gotten 58 uh, other Americans to commit 50% of their wealth that by during their lifetime or at their death, they'll commit 50% of their wealth to go back to society. And this was an idea that Warren Buffett and we came up with to really stimulate people to think about giving and to hopefully give even in their lifetime. And not to any causes that we're saying make sense, but whatever they want to give to. And what we find is that if peers see one another doing that, they say, well, why are you doing that? Well, how are you doing it? How are you thinking about it? And to have a lot of those wealthy people start to use their brains around philanthropy, can change the world. And so we're amazed we've got 58 this this far. You know, Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook, he's only 26 years old. He's already committed half his wealth. That That's an incredible thing and something we'd like to see happen in a lot of places. I gather people will come together for dinner and, and ideas discuss common interests. Do you expect a lot of common goals? I think that there'll be people who find they're both working on education or health or some area of research and they'll collaborate. So it'll never be all 58 because there's such a diversity of ideas and that's part of the richness of philanthropy. But yes, I think almost everyone will find someone else that uh, helps them work in a smarter, more effective way. What kind of chain reaction did you see, or any kind of reaction did you see after yourself and Warren Buffett did say, look, this is the way, when you have this kind of wealth, this is the way we should move forward? Well, over time, we'd like expectations on those who are very lucky to, to be higher. And who knows, that, that, that takes time. We know that this group of people, by sharing, will be smarter, will be more energetic. And even people, once they get going, they don't tend to stop at 50%. They tend to go way beyond that. 
We have had, although this group is US based, uh, other similar groups may get formed around the world. We're not sure. We'd be glad to reach out to those people and talk to them, even though our thing is, is United States centric. Do you, do you sense that the world has changed? Certainly this, this um, in America, always known for its consumerism and, and wealth acquisition, that there is a, a wave of change at all, or is this still very much a drop? No, I think when you talk to the youth in, in the US and the number that want to think about doing something in the world and giving back, I think there's a sea change going on. And if you even look just at the number of public health programs that have been created in the last 10 years and the enrollments in those, or the number of kids in the United States going into something called Teach for America, where they go back and teach in the public school system, I think you're seeing a, a sea change. And I, I'm excited to see where that's going to go. I'm also excited to see how the youth are going to use social media to get themselves organized to make change in the world. And I think that's going to be fun to watch. Mr. Case, I have to ask you, a lot of people aren't aware that uh, since 2008 you, you've been rather hands-off with Microsoft. You've, you've, been, you've become a non-executive chairman and are more focused on, on the work you're doing with the foundation. What, what has made you take that that your hands off such an innovative company and, and take this role on? Well, the work at the foundation is very intense. Uh, understanding how polio can be done better, meeting with scientists, working on a malaria vaccine, uh, figuring out uh, how can we get rid of this cold chain and simplify that. So I think this is very important work. I, I enjoy it just like I enjoyed my work at Microsoft. So I'm, I'm quite part-time. Uh, you know, I love the company, great people there, uh, wonderful business that they're in. And there's some intersection in education. We're using technology. Um, over time, cell phones will have a role to play for financial services and some of these health activities. So I'm staying up to date on technology. I have to ask you though, when you, when you first decided to take on this, you know, being empowered with wealth and, and obviously a very visible name, did you expect it to be a fairly easy path to execution, or not easy, but at least an easier path? Um, have you found it to be more bogged down with politics and bureaucracy? Well, everything is, is hard. Uh, you've got to bring people along. You have to articulate the cause. And at Microsoft, we were willing to take on some very big challenges and bring in talented people and deal with uh, things where things didn't go well and understand how to uh, get around that and end up with, with a lot of big successes. So I think my foundation work has a lot of similarities. Yes, I'm working a, a bit more with governments, uh, but then again, they come through like the UK with great generosity or Abu Dhabi, so uh, that's, that's time well spent. So it's, it's more similar than I expected. I've been doing it part-time uh, earlier, so I, it wasn't a totally abrupt transition. I just flipped to where this became the, the top priority. And of course, you're, you're a foremost example of a powerhouse couple doing this philanthropic work. And I, I wonder, uh, you're credited with much of that, that as well, you know, driving that, uh, especially recently. And I wonder um, where those values have come from and, and how you make it work as a team. Well, we both were fortunate to grow up in families that really believed in giving back, whether that, that was volunteerism or civic duty or sitting on a board or raising money for an organization. So we both grew up with those values of it's important to give back to the world. And then while we were engaged, we had already decided that the resources from Microsoft would go back to society. So that decision was an easy one and we would made it. And then I think for us, it's been really a journey of learning together. And that's been really fun and stimulating for us the last 12 years. We both travel some together and some separately but you know when I come back from a trip from Kenya and Ghana the first person I want to talk to about is Bill and when he comes back from India I, the first person I think he wants to talk to is me and we learn from one another and we have slightly different perspectives we come at it in slightly different ways but then we take apart the problems together or one of us will get a chance to focus on agriculture nutrition and the other will get to focus on vaccines for a while but we're constantly learning in parallel and teaching each other what we're learning and that's been a really fun couple for us journey for us as a couple. And of course you have a passion for uh, uh, mother and child welfare and, and health care. And, and why in particular was that, was that your passion at the time or has it been your passion? I just think when you travel in the developing world, you just you see the plight of mothers and you just say, my gosh, what they're up against. So I just, my heart goes to them when I'm in the developing world and then the things that we talk about, the vaccines, those are the things that are changing those mothers' lives by saving their children. And so the, the two just come together for me then naturally for both the science and the pieces I learn in the field. Billy Melinda Gates, I want to thank you very much for your time, very precious time, of course, and congratulations on your announcement. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thank you for joining us with your questions. Don't forget you can follow updates of the show on Facebook and send us your suggestions on the topics and questions for our guests. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.